So now that you know how NIMHD is engaged in this space, let's get started with our speakers. Our first speaker for this session is Dr. Brian McMahon. He's a clinical liver specialist and director of the Liver Disease and Hepatitis Program, the Alaska Native Medical Center in Anchorage, Alaska. He has directed the vaccination programs in Alaska Natives that have reduced the rates of acute hepatitis. Today, he's going to present on eliminating hepatitis C infection in urban and rural Alaska, unique challenges and progress to date. Dr. McMahon, take it away. Thank you very much, Dr. Dawson. Hope you can all hear me. Can I have the next slide, please? The next slide, please. So Alaska is quite a large uh, state, um, two and a half times bigger than Texas, but it stretches, if we impose it on the lower 48, from uh, Sacramento to all the way to Savannah, Georgia, uh, from east to west, and from, uh, and from Duluth, Mont uh, Minnesota, all the way to Savannah, Georgia. So it's an enormous area to cover. Next slide. So the Alaska Native uh, uh, Liver Disease and Hepatitis Program has been, uh, was established in the early 1980s, first tackled hepatitis B, and we are, uh, hepatitis B, the only endemic area in the United States is in Western Alaska, uh, and we have stopped transmission uh, by mass screening of the population and vaccination and introducing a newborn uh, vaccination for hepatitis B uh, in the early 1980s. And, um, and we've all also linked uh, all of the chronic persons with hepatitis B to care uh, since that time. But hepatitis C is, a, is a, a much bigger challenge for us at this point. And uh, we started working in hepatitis C, uh, doing research in hepatitis C uh, back in uh, the 1990s. And uh, we started out with a 10-year center grant with University of Washington, followed by an R01 uh, grant uh, from University of Washington for five years. And then, uh, and then since then, we've had CDC five-year grants. And Dr. John Ward, when he's a, the director of the Division of Viral Hepatitis at CDC, was very instrumental in, in helping us with these grants and also giving us a lot of guidance for the work that we've done in hepatitis C. So the first thing that we did in hepatitis C was to look and, and see uh, what was the effect of transmission uh, or what was the effective outcome of hepatitis C prior to the development of direct acting antiviral drugs. We offered patients that we found with hepatitis C interferon, but most weren't interested. And those who started interferon oftentimes dropped out or, uh, or didn't finish. And then the, uh, the, the uh, sustained virologic response rate was only about um, 40%. So those people who uh, who didn't receive interferon uh, or, or, or didn't, didn't get an SVR were followed prospectively. They had a liver biopsy when they entered to see if they should be treated or not. And they were followed prospectively for uh, almost eight years. Next slide. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But uh, then in when 2014, when the direct acting antiviral drugs became available, then we started offering those drugs to every person, literally every person, who had chronic hepatitis C uh, to treat those uh, to treat them and get them cured. Uh, we also purchased uh, two fiber scan units. One uh, was a uh, was in our clinic, our liver clinic in Anchorage. The other is a portable unit that we take out to the field when we go out to do field liver clinics. Um, so after that, we rarely did liver biopsies on patients with hepatitis C. So um, we then uh, uh, received a, a number of, again, from the CDC primarily, grants to study the outcome of treatment of hepatitis C. Uh, so we worked with our partners statewide uh, and to try to eliminate hepatitis C. And we wanted to compare the response uh, and outcomes uh, in, in relation to liver-related death, liver failure, and hepatocellular carcinoma. In this cohort that we had recruited prior to the availability of direct acting antivirals, and then after uh, and direct acting antivirals were uh, were available, and I should mention that every one of those persons who didn't get a direct acting uh, didn't were treated prior to 2015 that were in that first cohort all were offered DAA treatment, and most of them actually took it. Next slide. So here's what we've accomplished so far. 
We've treated uh, over 1,200 persons all over the state and 97% SVR, and there's been 32 known reinfections. So fairly successful uh, start. Next slide. Now, this is the problem. If you look at this map and you see that in the center of the map in Anchorage um, uh, is where we are, we are located. And each one of those bigger dots uh, is where there's a hospital or a clinic located. But the 200 little dots are small little villages where there's no licensed provider. And the care is provided in these villages by community health aid practitioners. They're indigenous people who receive a 16 week uh, uh, course uh, uh, and have a manual and have a computer uh, available. And they are the ones who see the patients in these communities. So if we're gonna eliminate hepatitis C, we have to be able to work with these community health aid practitioners and, and help them to learn how to diagnose and treat hepatitis C. Next slide. So the other problem that we have in Alaska is that hepatitis C knows, as everybody knows, knows no racial or uh, ethnic boundaries. So if we're gonna eliminate hepatitis C in the Alaska native population, we have to eliminate hepatitis C in the entire state of Alaska. So we formed a group called the HOG, uh, the Hepatitis Alaska Statewide Working Group. We meet quarterly, we met yesterday. And um, these are the partners you can see uh, in the HOG um, uh, and are very actively involved. And we uh, set up educational programs around the state to train uh, licensed providers on how to uh, diagnose and screen for hepatitis C and how to treat hepatitis C. And so the goal of the HOG is to eliminate both hepatitis C and hepatitis B uh, in Alaska. Next slide. So I want to show you, go back and show you the outcome of those 412 patients that we did liver biopsies on before DAAs were available. Some took interferon and then uh, all of these people either failed interferon, refused interferon, uh, or uh, quit during, while they were treated. So two thirds of those patients had only mild fibrosis, 20% uh, had severe fibrosis or bridging fibrosis and 10% had cirrhosis, next slide. So what was the outcome of these patients in, in, the, in, in terms of end-stage liver disease, hepatocellular carcinoma or liver related death? And this is published in Hepatology in 2017, next slide. So the first table shows you the outcome in the patients with end-stage liver disease. At the beginning, uh, when they had their liver biopsy, um, 150 of them had mild disease. After 10 years, 8.4% developed liver failure. If they had moderate fibrosis um, at the beginning and liver biopsy, by the end of 10 years, 20% developed liver failure. With severe or bridging fibrosis, 31% um, at 10 years developed it. And if, they, and if the initial biopsy showed compensated cirrhosis, they didn't, uh, we, that group didn't uh, live long enough that we could actually do a 10 year follow up because, two, because three quarters of them had either developed liver failure uh, uh, at, at, 10, at uh, the uh, seven year period. Next slide. Looking at um, the outcome of hepatocellular carcinoma, a similar picture only 1% of those with mild disease at 10 years, 5% of those with moderate disease on biopsy at 10, at 10 years later, and, um, and uh, eight percent of those with uh, severe disease, but a third of those that had cirrhosis, compensated cirrhosis by seven years developed hepatocellular carcinoma. Next slide, please. And as far as either liver related death or having a liver transplant, um, you can again see that uh, only 1% if they, they only had mild or no scarring at biopsy uh, versus 3% uh, if they had moderate versus 12% if they had severe versus about a quarter of them uh, if they had compensated cirrhosis at the time of their biopsy seven years later. Next slide. So one of the things we're, that we're doing right now, and I, 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 we, we obviously are in the middle of this study and I can't really show you the results, but what we're doing is we're looking at those patients who, re who have received DAA and were cured. And we're doing the same uh, thing, only we're using FibroScan uh, to follow them every year. And we're comparing the adverse outcomes of hepatitis C un, uh, patients to that group that I just showed you of untreated patients. Um, and we're looking for uh, other factors that might influence uh, what happens to them after they're cured 
including uh, demographic factors, social factors. Uh, they all get an audit C alcohol uh, 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 test every time we see them to see how, if there's alcohol as a, a factor. And we also look for NAFLD in these patients using the, the, the standard uh, uh, techniques for, for diagnosing NAFLD. Next slide. So we have a, a over a thousand consented patients in this study. Um, we take care of anybody who lives in rural communities um, uh, are, are cared for by the Alaska Native Tribal System. It's a, it's a tribally owned uh, healthcare system. Um, and so if you're, if you're not Alaska Native, you still get taken care of by them. But if you live in an urban area where there's uh, hospitals and private uh, providers, then you're, then you're not uh, seen in those areas. Um, we've had a, uh, over a thousand are still alive and are actively still in our, in our uh, study. Next slide. And these are the, uh, the uh, clinical uh, uh, features that we're looking at, NAFLD, uh, uh, over 100 have NAFLD, uh, over 300 have diabetes or prediabetes. So far, we've seen uh, 49 patients with hepatocellular carcinoma, um, and uh, we have uh, uh, a few with HIV. They're going to be dropped out of the analysis. And these are uh, the outcomes thus far, liver transplant 11, decompensated cirrhosis 11, and cirrhosis 46. Now, these are, again, all patients that have been treated with DAAs and, and reached an SVR and are followed for at least five years after that, or will be followed for five years after that. Next slide. So uh, one of the big problems that we have had is that though, although we've diagnosed a lot of hep C, we're ever having trouble getting everybody treated because even though we offer the drugs for free, uh, sometimes they don't come in to get it and we can't find them. Next slide. So we're hiring patient navigators to begin to go out and try to find, um, again, with CDC uh, funding, go out and find these people that haven't been treated and also to enhance screening at places where we have where people with high risk for HCV uh, uh, go to. That includes homeless shelters, um, needle exchange programs, free clinics and opioid rehabilitation programs. And in these programs, we're offering screening both to Alaska Native people and non-Native people. Uh, Non-Native people will be referred uh, to uh, clinics that uh, care for them, and then Alaska Native people will come into our system to be treated. Next slide. So one of the really unique uh, programs, uh, uh, oh, I, I might just say that uh, so far, some of the things that have been exciting is that one of our tribal organizations, so there's 12 tribal organizations in Alaska, and one of them uh, has a, a place to prompt in their computer that pops up every time someone has a blood draw if they've never been tested for hepatitis C. And it, it, it tells the person uh, who's uh, gonna draw their blood, ask them if they wanna be treated for hepatitis C. And if they say yes, that's added onto the blood test. Another tribal organization is really aggressively working to screen everyone and fe feel they'll reach the 2030 uh, goals that are set out by CDC and WHO by, by 2027. And another uh, tribal group is using pharmacists to manage and treat uh, the patients with hepatitis C once a licensed provider has written the medication and done a physical exam. And then they're completely taken care of for the rest of their treatment and, and follow up by the pharmacist. Next slide. I think one of the most unique things that we're doing right now, again, with a grant from CDC, is we're training these community health aid practitioners, uh, the barefoot doctors in the 200 villages, um, to um, uh, screen with a rapid finger stick test for hepatitis C. If it's positive, draw blood. That's one of the things that they do. Uh, and send it to our lab. And if they're HCRNA positive, then one of our liver providers uh, 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 works with the health aid and the patient via telemedicine so they don't have to leave their community multiple times to fly 100 or 200 miles to the nearest place where there is a licensed provider. These villages are not obviously uh, connected by roads. So we've conducted um, uh, two-day programs to train uh, these community health aid providers how to do this. And then um, again, we are using telemedicine. Um, and we've trained providers in 11 communities um, thus far, and then uh, we'll try to expand this program uh, over the next few years. Next slide. So in conclusion, hepatitis C virus infection is present, uh, and an estimated 3 to 5% of Alaska Native people, we're actually finding in some of these small communities, it's closer to 10% that have hepatitis C. 
The liver disease and hepatitis program has been doing research in hepatitis C since the 1990s, supported by NIH and CDC. We're working with the state of Alaska, and we also, I forgot to mention, have a branch of CDC right on our campus. There's about 35 people that work there. They're very involved, obviously, as well as the Division of Viral Hepatitis. And uh, we're working with them in the state to try to implement universal screening in Alaska. And we're working with the tribal uh, uh, programs to implement uh, hepatitis C screening in rural communities and treatment by telemedicine. And our goal is to reach the HCV elimination targets in the state of Alaska by 2030. Um, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mann. This is really fascinating to hear all the great efforts you're um, doing in Alaska. We have uh, a few questions that have come up, so maybe um, we can answer. One of them is, did you investigate or collect reasons for the high dropout in the outcome study? Well, the first study, we only had interferon available. Um, and and uh, I think if, 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 any, if any of you have treated people with interferon, uh, it's, it's a horrible drug and uh, makes them very sick. And, uh, and uh, that's why they dropped out. Uh, a lot of, most of them didn't want it. But since we've used DAA, if a patient says, uh, I want to take DAA, we've had less than 5% drop out. Uh, the problem is, is a lot of people are still um, doing risky behavior and they don't want to come in and get treated or it's really hard to find them. And so that's one of the efforts that we're doing right now is to try to track them down with the patient navigator and get them to start treatment and figure out unique ways to, to get them to finish their DAA treatment. But no problem with DAA. It's, it's a... It's miraculous drugs with minimal side effects, as everyone on this webinar knows, uh, with, uh, with a very high uh, sustained virologic response rate. Thank you. Yeah, I think some of the things that you discussed about having a, a community health worker or having access to treatment through telemedicine, that kind of resonates with uh, the populations that uh, we are interested in. Uh, we have another question. Have you had any issues with medical associations pushing back on allowed CHAs to conduct this type of service for patients? Uh, I know DHTs were similar and ADA pushed back on allowing them to deliver certain services. Not in Alaska, we haven't had any problem. Um, the other thing that's really unique, uh, the, we don't usually get pharmaceutical companies to give us free medications uh, uh, you know, unless and the only way we can get medicines for other diseases like diabetes, for example, is through Medicare, Medicaid, or private insurance. And then our systems uh, uh, get some money from the government. It's not enough to cover all the, the patient care, but that money could be used to buy drugs. But this, but the but the two companies that make the DAAs are giving the drugs for free to us as long as someone doesn't qualify for Medicare or Medicaid. And, uh, and so we can treat everybody. Okay, thank you, Dr. Mann. This is great. We will continue uh, with addressing the other questions during our discussion session. 